So this is the, this is the new baby cub on the way. <laughs> anyway, thanks for the introduction and WCN and everyone for being here. Hopefully that's what ours looks like. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it comes out nice and small like these guys do. <laughs> so that is a spectacled bear cub in the wild. It's a poor footage, but actually that was taken on a cell phone. <laughs> so that was the first den we've ever found and the first one we've ever found for the species. So unfortunately, the population is, is declining. And beautiful bear cubs like this, as though they're charismatic, elusive, beautiful. Uh, there's less than 5,000 left in the world, and so, to say the least, we are panicking and are hoping the best for them, but we need to work really hard to prevent their population decline and ensure that they will be here in the future. So this is a typical view of the high elevation habitat. Fragmented, hard to see where these bears would be living. Um, there's a lot of illegal land trafficking as well, and you can see here very little water, so the competition for water is really high. The people don't have enough water, the wildlife don't have enough water, and so as a result, these poor bears are just, they're not reaching the habitat that they need, they're not getting fat, they're not able to reproduce, <laughs> and so unfortunately they are dying. But that doesn't have to happen, and thank you to WCN and all these amazing donors and other funders, we have been able to help this population, but we have a lot more to do, and so we can make a difference and we can stop this decline, but we have to work fast. So Peru, most people know Peru here. And when you think of Peru, what do you think of? Machu Picchu. <laughs> you think of Machu Picchu, you think of llamas. And then this story, as Hefe had mentioned, people know about Paddington and have seen this book. And especially, I'm noticing now the new generation not so much. So I've put this out, it's a Hollywood movie. So people know the Hollywood movie here. <laughs> so, but what people don't really realize is that this bear is actually Paddington bear, and it lives in Peru. And I would say it doesn't necessarily live around Machu Picchu, but it actually, in fact, does live around the forest. And so what's important is we're trying to link the two together and help people understand that there are bears in South America. Paddington bear is one of those bears. And so um, I've got a little clips of a video, and I think the video of the Hollywood film, I think they did a great job of just showing you the, <laughs> the charismatic behavior of this species. And so this is thanks to BBC, they were filming with us for Planet Earth. So this just shows you a little bit of their, their personalities. They have a lot of time to play <laughs> in the midday heat. <laughs> So, as many of you may already know, there's eight bear species in the world, but many of the tropical bears are the least studied, and the onion bear, spectacle bear being one of them. And so they have a very small range within South America, and it's actually the only bear in South America. But there's another reason why we should actually study and care about these, these bears all across the world. Um, one of the main reasons is that they maintain the balance in the ecosystem, and so being the top predator, they keep um, herbivores such as deer, they keep them sort of in check. And so if there weren't bears in these ecosystems, especially in this high elevation habitat, the deers would be everywhere, the tapir would be eating the plants, they'd be destroying much of what's important about the high elevation habitat. And so that's one of the reasons it's Im important to keep these guys up there. But also they're dispersers of seeds. They, they plant the forest basically, so we don't have to do it for them. And you can see here their scats and just leaving their scats around, the, they're germinating and they're putting their trees everywhere. So um, a little bit about spectacle bears. As you probably have already figured out, they have rings. Not all of them, but many of them have rings around their eyes, and it looks like they're wearing uh, glasses. So they're known as spectacle bears in Spanish, and in English we tend to use Andean bears, so I'm sorry I flip back and forth between the two, but uh, typically we try to use spectacle bear just for, for s in Spanish. Um, this is much of their, their habitat, typical habitat. It's cloud forest, and it's almost all mine tenure, and you can see in the background there's a little squiggly road, so this is a mining 
well, basically the entire area is mining, but you can see <coughs> that this forest is, uh, it's immense, it's huge actually. But one of the biggest problems that a lot of my colleagues have and people in the past is trying to find this species. I mean, this is, typical, this is a typical day. Cloudy, dense forest, I mean, trying to move through that ecosystem is really, really challenging. And so trying to find them, trying to figure out where they are, what are they doing, what do they need, what do they eat, has been really challenging. And so uh, 2006, <laughs> I set off with Javier Vallejos <laughs> as part of my PhD, trying to find these bears thinking, I'm from Canada, I can, I can maneuver through this dense forest with clouds, but L little did I know, <laughs> dense, this, is a, this was a whole new meaning of dense. But anyways, so we set off with our backpacks, went out for uh, about nine months trying to find bears with no luck. We hiked everywhere, we came back, restocked, carried as much as we co possibly could into the field. Uh, but it just wasn't happening. We tried to get in supplies with horses, as you can see here. But it was, it was a lot of work and we were starting to well, feel a little hopeless nine months, day after day after day after day. And one day we were going to the next uh, range over, this is the last chance and I, that's it, I was going home and probably gonna study grizzly bears again. <laughs> so we were talking to the, some of the people and they said, yeah, there's no bears in this area, but you can make it if you get over the next mountain range here, you'll be able to make it to the next mountain range and up to the high elevation cloud forest. So off we went, but we had to cross some of this really intense, spiny, cliff habitat with lots of cactus, and I'm not used to cactus, so I can't tell you how many I must have had in my head, <laughs> so I don't wear hats anymore, <laughs> just so I can keep my eyes open, but it was really tough, it was challenging, and we weren't expecting to find bears, we weren't expecting to find much of, much of anything, but there was lots of birds, a lot of endemic birds, it was really enjoyable one morning, just sitting there watching, waiting for the, for the birds, and sure enough, we're sitting there with Javier, and we see this black dot coming down this cliff, thinking, is that a tyra? What, what is that? And sure enough, as many of you have heard my story before, it was actually a black bear, or <laughs> a spectacle bear, sorry, <laughs> on that cliff. I mean, who's expecting to look up there and actually see a bear walking down something like that? I mean, this is just completely outside of what I had ever imagined would be bear habitat, black bear, grizzly bear, any kind of bear, spectacled bear. And so that was the start of our project. And we were, uh, we're very close to the coast, we're about 20, um, kilometers from the coast on the east west side of the Andes and it's a very dry dry ecosystem and so uh, we called some of our colleagues wildlife media and asked them to come down and this is actually a little clip of some of the very first footage we ever got of this special bear called Laura But what was really special about this, this bear in particular and these bears, actually is they're really curious. And so while they're known as being this elusive bear, as you see in the Paddington book in Deepest Darkest Peru, they're actually very charismatic, very curious. And as <laughs> we tried to maintain our distance, they kept coming closer and closer, and especially this bear, Laura. And this is actually the very first, these are some of the very first photos I took that day of this species. So that was pretty, ex <laughs> pretty exciting. But I mean, I always put up this photo, but I mean, when do you see bears crossing a cliff like that? I mean, so it, it allowed us to find them, but trying to keep up with them was a whole other <laughs> world. So we needed a lot of ropes to get around. And <laughs> just how they use this environment. So she's trying to, there's, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a honey, little honeycomb up there. And so she's trying to scale up and we have a video footage, but it's so shaky, I couldn't play it, but she's trying to get the honey. So I mean, they're looking for anything they can get. But another thing that's sort of a treat for them are these little snails and they're underneath these overhang cliffs and they're, we call them little protein pops because they're just little tiny protein. They're kind of cool because they're in the shade. So here's some footage of what it looks like trying to get to these areas. And it's really scary watching them, especially the cubs. good climbers or the good or good protein <laughs> what's that no 
I mean, this is a question, have we seen them falling? But we've never seen them fall. Almost, they do little like semi-falls. <laughs> I feel like we're gonna fall. We hold our breath when we watch them, especially the little cubs that are three months old. So life is actually very tough for these guys in this ecosystem. It's hot, it's energetically costly, it takes a lot to move around. So <coughs> it's also challenging for us, this is Javier. So they rest, we rest, they move, we move. <laughs> it's kind of just how the day goes. Um, but here's a little clip again by BBC just to give you some idea of what this ecosystem looks like. And in condor. So it's a pretty harsh environment, not like the photo I showed you at the beginning with the cloud forest and the fog and the dense vegetation. It's very different. So these guys have to work out like big time to keep their fitness up. So these guys are doing their abdominal workout. <laughs> 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 but what we did realize very quickly on is that um, it's really important to engage the community. We cannot do the work without them. And so we built up a conservation center. We have accommodation there for visitors and scientists, other people who are coming and are interested in uh, seeing these spectacle bears and also to have a place to engage the community. Um, people didn't realize there was bears in this area. And so when the word got out, it was really exciting for a lot of the people. And I think because we are able to show them how amazing these bears are and their personalities, the kids really engage with them, the teachers and the people from the community. So it was something of excitement for the community. And for us, it just meant a lot of field work. So for the first six years, I spent basically every day of my life, 250 days a year with these three guys, <laughs> trying to find these guys, trying to figure out where they are, what they do, what they need. And um, we put up camera traps, and we took a lot of photos like this. And the one great thing about Spectacle Bear is they have different facial markings. They all have names, and we can identify them. But if we get photos like this, that's not so <laughs> easy. <laughs> or we get this, and this is, the, this is what a lot of them like to do. <laughs> A little bit too lazy to walk anywhere. So. This is a small water hole too, so it's a little bit muddy. So I don't know if that's cooling his stomach or, but he's en route to the camera trap. Obviously, there was a little invasion of personal space, but what this bear Marco didn't realize is that we had secret cameras. <laughs> so this is him pulling our camera apart. <laughs> you can see the... <laughs> He's really getting the body into that to pull that out. We have it wired down. <laughs> and then he got tired of that, so I guess he thought, oh. <laughs> nice smudgy lens, and we wonder why it's hard to get good footage. <laughs> but what we did realize from putting these cameras out and spending a lot of time walking through this area is the importance of water. So most of these bears spend a lot of time feeding on cactus. And then there's these small oasis that look incredible, and you'd think we're in the Amazon, but in fact, they're just a small dot in a very uh, dry landscape. We found five in total. So that water hole is up there in that one tree. So it's very dry, five tiny little water holes in a huge area. So we know water is life, but this fruit called the sapote fruit is also life for this species. And we learned that very quickly the first year. And unfortunately, it's not in the mountains. And so while thinking, oh, we need to protect the mountains, these bears actually need to come down into the dry desert to reach this plant. And without this fruit, the sapote fruit, which is a really fat, high calorie, uh, food. The bears don't go into estrus, they don't reproduce, and basically life comes to a stop. And unfortunately, the villages also need this wood to cook on, and so we are working on a project with them to find another uh, 
wood that they can use that doesn't have the same impact. And just their presence in the forest going in uh, when the bears are reproducing and they're coming down and trying to feed on, on the sapote. But they're using it for cooking, so we can't just tell them to stop. So it's one of the challenges we have. When they're not feeding on sapote, they eat this tree called the pasayo. So just like a beaver, they eat the entire tree. They don't just chew on it. They don't just eat the outside. They eat the entire tree from top to bottom. And they can sit there for two to three weeks eating, and, and that's what it looks like, just pulverized. <laughs> and interesting scats, it's just dry, dry cork. So it's low calorie. It's not a high food, but it gets them through the dry months so they can get to the sapote the following year. This is just a really short clip of what it looks like for a cub eating, trying to pull out the, the wood from the tree. Tasty. <laughs> it's dry, actually. It's really dry. We've tried and it has a sweet flavor, but it's low in calories, so it's really just, just to get them through the winter. And that or the snails. So between the sapote, the pasayo, that's basically all they have for the entire year. But the good news is, and we were always concerned about this at the beginning, well, if they're eating a tree all winter, is there going to be any trees left? But as you can see here, it actually um, sprouts again, and the trees continue to regrow and regrow. So they have little impact. But what is really important that they reach these resources. And uh, after we collared these bears, we realized they actually walk far distances. So this is a male collared bear. It walked 150 kilometers. Um, <clears throat> within four days. So that's huge, and you can see on his foot, I mean, the rock is hot, it's sharp, they get blisters, so it's, it's not easy, and we need, to, we need to make sure that they can get to these areas and, um, and feed. But some of the challenges that we have here in, in northern Peru with conservation is, in the early 1900s, basically all northern Peru was hacienda, so they were all broken up into parcels of land with a main house, and um, they weren't slaves, but they where a lot of people working for one family. And then when communism came in, they uh, sent all these people off, they ran off to the States, to Europe, and all of the communities ended up owning each, each of the haciendas. And so that worked up until a few decades ago. Unfortunately, land trafficking and drug laundering is a huge problem in the North, and they started taking over the land and stealing it from the local communities. And so. In 2011, the government came in, and this is a protected area, and they came in with 2,000 military. They removed a lot of the land mafia from the area that they were cutting down the forest, selling it, doing illegal logging, transferring drugs. <coughs> and while that was great, and they did a great job on the protected area, that didn't help us in the communities that we were working with. And so within the first few years, we started having lawsuits. <coughs> so we've had eight lawsuits in the 10 years that we've been there fighting the mafia and working with the community to try to get them out because the last thing that the mafia wants are private protected areas and they don't want to empower the communities to do anything about it. So it did get a little bit close to home. This is just outside of our conservation center. We started having explosives and we had to have um, restraining orders and it was a tough go, but it became really personal when they started killing the bears that we were studying. And <coughs> this is one of the photos of one of the bears killed and they started hanging bear parts at our base camp, <coughs> and I'm, I'm hormonal emotional because I'm pregnant, so I'll try not to cry, but it's not nice, it's not pleasant to find your bears hanging by bits and pieces at your base camp, so, but <coughs> we wanted to make sure bears like this, like Laura, had a future and survived, so we worked really hard, had great lawyers, had a great group of communities that came together, and we fought the mafia, and three, four years ago now, we put the three ringleaders, I guess, in jail, so, they're there for 25 years, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and this area now of the dry forest has become an archaeological ecological park. So we at least feel rest assured that a small bear population is protected, but that is just one small part of what we need to do in the next bit. So while we thought things were certainly starting to calm down and <laughs> The mafia has gone to jail. We can start getting back at our work. This was the end of last year. We had major droughts and big forest fires broke out. <clears throat> Unfortunately, our camera traps were burned and the government is just <laughs> not on it. They didn't send anybody up there and so we're sitting there watching the smoke and watching the fires thinking, what do we do? Do we go out there and put out fires? I mean, we can put a bucket, but I mean, what, what is a small team like ours gonna do? And so 
<coughs> our team is really dedicated and they took it upon themselves. They went up, got the communities, rounded up people. They did their own fundraising. It's the first time actually we've ever had funding come from the cities in northern Peru and they were able to fundraise enough money. We were able to buy um, shovels and helmets and we had hundreds of people out there uh, fighting these fires, but we did lose um, about 30,000 hectares so of prime bear habitat. So that was pretty distressing for all of us. But the climate has been just, I mean, it's been one year after the other, drought, 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 drought. But then we had the biggest shock of ever after this year. <coughs> and this is some of the vegetation that was lost, just beautiful vaccinium, like blueberry food habitat, lush forest, just, just devastated. You can see here, this was uh, October 26, 2016, and this is one month later. You can see the bear there, so the habitat was just wiped out. But unfortunately, a lot of these fires, so the drought <laughs> wasn't, the fires weren't started from lightning, they were started from a lot of the local people, and there's this belief up in the high altitude that if you make smoke, <laughs> it creates rain. But that's usually because they're burning before a little bit of the rain comes, so Anyway, so we've had to spend a lot of the last couple of months trying to educate the people and teach them. It's really lighting your fire is only burning down your forests and it's burning your communities. People lost their houses. And so we've had to reshift a lot of what we're doing in the last little bit to focus on that. And then just as things were getting under control, the fires were out, we're thinking, okay, we're past. <laughs> All of a sudden, the low elevation where our conservation center is started flooding. So we went from extreme drought, which is still a drought in the high elevation, to extreme flooding but to flooding that basically Peru has never seen in its time. And I'm sure many of you heard of it here, it was reaching international news. So this is us out in the middle of the night trying to put sandbags around our conservation center, trying to guide the water, but it was pretty devastating. So this is just our, the side of our conservation center. And actually in the nighttime, it comes like flash floods. The trees were almost covered in water. So we had over 25 feet of water in an area we have never even seen water before. <laughs> so it was just crazy. This is some of our staff housing. They just got demolished. So a lot of people have asked me, well, what does that mean for bears and how, how good is that for bears? And so, well, on the left, you can see that it's um, dry and on the right, it seems green and lush. And you may think that's great for, for wildlife. And I think in, in, in reality, a few thousand years ago, perhaps a nice big flood in El Nino or water like that could be really advantageous for the ecosystem. But in fact, we're not really sure what this means for bears, and I think for a lot of species, migratory birds and things, perhaps that is, it is uh, beneficial, but in terms of bears, uh, we're really concerned about what this means for them in the next year. That is a sapote tree. Now, normally this is dry desert. <laughs> you don't see any green, and this vine is just covering the sapote. And so what we've seen with a little bit of rain that we've had in the past is that the trees don't actually pollinate and we can't get sapote. If they don't have sapote, as I told you earlier, they won't reproduce, they can't get fat enough, they won't get through the winter. And so we're worried now about how this will affect them next year. I think now they have enough food, there's new fruits we've never seen and they're eating grass and they've got enough water, so I think life is great for them. But long term, I don't think this is gonna be um, great. And I think what we're gonna see again, as we've seen in the past, is the females stop lactating um, they don't have enough fat to carry them through the winter, so the cubs start dying, um, starving to death, basically, as do many of the females. And so this is one of the cubs that has died before from starvation, and the mums just don't have enough. This is the video of the last, um, the last time we saw this cub before it passed away. Oops. Oh, well, it didn't play, but it, it's probably best because I don't need to cry on stage right now. <laughs> So, so just reiterating again, the importance of Sapote is huge and working with the communities, trying to find alternative woods and trying to find new practices, trying to help them understand <coughs> um, the impact that they can have and when they should be trying to go in and collect wood. And so we installed so, um, these uh, cocinas mejoradas, these um, stoves that use a lot less wood and we can use other wood as opposed to Sapote, which lasts a lot longer. So we're trying to educate them on ways that have less effect, but Ultimately, it has a huge effect on starvation, and we are still seeing this every year. We lose bears every year to starvation, so that's something we're desperately working on. Trying to raise a cub like that in an ecosystem like this is super challenging. I mean, as you can see, they don't have a lot of food. We know that the females will go up to six months without drinking water. Uh, they're not eating for four months, and then they have to carry a baby cub through that landscape with the, cu with the huge cliff, so it's not easy for them. 
So that's basically what a bear looks like when it has cubs, and that's what it looks like without cubs. Within three months, the, um, the bear almost doubled in size. So again, this is just a little footage of what it looks like for them to move across that landscape. This is the main area that they take their cubs. Yeah. Their, their body size? Um, uh, the females are around 50 kilos, and the males are about 80 to 100 kilos. So they're not, bi they're not big. And I, I, we actually question whether this is actually a subspecies of the bears that live in the, the cloud forest. Just their bodies are long and lean, and the way they can climb up the mountains, and they're very different. So uh, we spend a lot of time working with the communities. This is, this is key to doing our work. I, I, I am a scientist, I love the research, and it's fascinating, but it won't mean anything if we can't do anything with it. So we spend a lot of time working with the, with the communities. We also work with the children. As everybody knows, that's our next generation, and we're trying to start fresh and try to engage them into understanding the importance of nature and really connecting with it and appreciating what they have in their backyards. And so one of the programs we've started this year was, um, was I guess inspired by Shivani, one of the WCN partners, and her kids' camps, was just trying to engage kids a little bit more. Um, bears are hard to engage. We also don't want to impact their life and what they're doing, and trying to get children into the field site isn't advantageous. And so what we've done is we've rescued a number of horses, and we really do believe that by changing the way children feel about animals, so domestic pets are really poorly treated. The dogs are skinny, they're beaten, the animals are tied on chains, and it's, it's heart-wrenching, and so by rescuing these horses, and that's part of their cultural history, these are Paso from per Peruvian Paso horses, we, we have the children come for every weekend, and they're brushing them, washing them, riding them, and learning to trust and respect animals. We're teaching them about their personalities and trying to show them that each one is an individual, and we feel that will help them relate when we're showing them the different bears and different bear names and what it's like for a mother to rear her cub and the, the challenges she goes through, and we think that's working so far, but I mean, it's, we started that this year. And then as many of you have seen outside at our table, we have Felty, which has been a program we've been running now, I think about six years, and it's been extremely successful. We've trained over 50 women. We built a center for them, and they're working outside of our, at our conservation center, and we sell these all around the world now. Little spectacle bears, and at Christmas time, Christmas ornaments, we have them on our website as well, on our shopping cart. And so this is a typical um, woman in, the, in our area, and the idea is to help empower the women also, and we're hoping that by doing this, we'll get more children back into school, which we've already seen. And so uh, children like Miriam here are now back to school, and it's expensive with their uniforms and having to buy the books and things. So this has been able to provide almost a full-time job to 50 women. And then there's WCN, <laughs> uh, we're one of the, uh, newest partners, and that has been life-changing for us, just being able to reach out to people like yourselves and share our story. We've been hiding in the bushes for a long time, and so it's been tough, but uh, Frances uh, has, she just won one of the scholarships through WCN, and so she's in Canada right now. She's from the small village of Bethingadande, where our conservation center is, and has been volunteering with us since she was 14. So she'll now be going to UBC and doing her master's, and this is key to get people like this who are going to be leading the conservation, is leading conservation in these villages and, and keeping things going in the future. So. And what we've started this year now, so this is at the top of the mountain, 4,000, so about 12, 13,000 feet, looking down at the dry forest. And so we've been spending the last 10 years working on the dry forest, but we've now grown our project thanks to all of the support, and we've been able to start looking for new populations of bears with the idea of hoping to connect each of these populations. We were able to buy our truck last year, which has allowed us to reach new areas and find new bear population. We just found one in this area, actually, that also has a number of uh, endangered endemic species, and it's spectacular. I mean, it really is spectacular, and the fact that this is all connected to the dry forest could have huge ecological value. So, We've started putting up some camera traps, and we're starting a huge camera trap study uh, in June, now that we can hopefully get back up there. The roads have been just destroyed, and we can <laughs> get more shots like this happy little bear. <laughs> but we've also got a couple of, these are just some of our preliminary camera traps, but we were able to find the mountain tapir. There's only 200 left in Peru. So there's other advantages for um, trying to protect bear habitat in critically endangered animals like this. There's only 2,000 left in the world with their cute little babies. 
<laughs> I had to throw some of these in because I think they're so adorable. <laughs> they have their little spots when they're young. Um, and some of the work we also, some of the data from our camera traps, we found um, a jaguar undi, which is another cat species that has never been seen on the west side of the Andes, and it's only been on the Amazon side. And so by reaching out to these new areas, we're learning so much more about the area, what it contains, and a lot of the important biodiversity of these areas, which uh, strengthens and helps us support like, the reasons why we want to create more protected areas. So uh, we've just started a workshop in the high elevation again, doing more felty. <laughs> Um, we think this is a really good way of, of engaging the community, so we hope we can keep growing it. If anyone has any ideas of stores or places we could sell out, we'd really appreciate learning about that, because the more we can sell, the more women we can hire and train, and that is our long-term goal. So if we can have 500, 800, 1,000 women all working up in these villages on that, that will really help us ultimately create more protected areas. So again, in educating them, we've started our, our program now in eight communities at the higher elevation, so hopefully that's going to be successful. So hopefully, with all of this work and with support, again, from everybody here, we, we really do feel like we can keep this bear alive and, <laughs> and keep, keep this bear. He's got chipotle all over his nose. <laughs> we want to keep these bears fed. We want to keep them in the wild, and we want to do whatever we possibly can to keep, make sure that that happens. And so we do have a few little positive news. I don't know if you can see that. That's a camera trap, but this was last month, so Magali has a new cub, so we always get really inspired when we see that the population is reproducing, so obviously, Hefe, my, my training is going well. <laughs> so please visit our, uh, our website. We have our shopping cart there. We have a Facebook, and we appreciate any, any advice on where we can sell our product and help grow that, and please spread the word about Spectacle Bear and tell everybody about Paddington. Now you know where it's from. Anyways, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks.